And so we do that through the help of companies such as Sennheiser. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dave Dunlop, Director of Sennheiser Aviation. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, and, and right back at you, Jeff. We, uh, we appreciate the work that Social Flight is doing to make educational events like this possible. Uh, at Sennheiser, we believe supporting general aviation is vitally important to preserving and promoting a culture of progress and of adventure. And that's why we support the work that Social Flight is doing to encourage participation and the growth of the aviation community. We're here tonight to talk about hearing health for pilots and how to maintain that against the high noise environment of the typical private aircraft cockpit. Many people think of Sennheiser in terms of high performance audio, professional music and broadcast where clarity and high power must be brought together. However, when we're designing an aviation headset, we focus on clarity and noise suppression to protect the pilot and the passengers from the damage that persistent noise can inflict. So to get started, let me introduce you to someone who knows both worlds of professional music and aviation. Ravi, the Raviator, has played guitar in one of the biggest bands in some of the biggest venues in the world. And also, he's learned to fly. Over to you, Ravi. All right, Dave. Thank you very much. Hey, it's great to be here. This is so much fun, doing these kind of webinars and, and connecting with all of you, the, my fellow pilots out there. Uh, what's better than that? And uh, to have a platform and um, a company like Social Flight that really helps us all get together online and find out about all these great events going on all over the country, all over the world, and of course, educational seminars like this. So I'm really uh, very proud to be working with both Sennheiser and Social Flight, and of course, all of you listening out there, the pilots. I mean, after all, we are what this industry is all about. And so uh, hearing preservation for pilots has just become a really important topic for me. I mean, I'm, I'm a, as Dave said, I'm a musician and a pilot. And these are the kinds of things that uh, I noticed when I started flying, it was so weird as a musician, and then I started flying, and I was running into more deaf pilots than I ever had rock and roll guitar players. And, of course, we always think about you know rock and roll being so loud. And so that was the question I kept asking myself is, why do I meet more hearing-impaired pilots than musicians? And that's the basis of this presentation. Um, it's really to, to address uh, this issue. You know, what causes hearing loss? That's the first step to figure it out, and then what can we do about it? How can we prevent hearing loss? Because it's, it's so important, and uh, I want you all to continue to be able to listen to great music as well. So it's a safety issue in the cockpit, but it's also a quality of life issue. Uh, just tell you a little bit about my background and, and uh, my ex noise exposure as well. You know, my dream growing up as a, as a kid was to be Angus Young of ACDC. The power of rock and roll, the loud electric guitar, stacks of amps. I mean, you know, uh, certainly a EMT's worst nightmare for a patient, you know, the loud rock and roll. And, but that was my dream. I loved what that was all about. And so on my 11th birthday, actually, my parents bought me my first uh, electric guitar, and I was ready to rock. You know, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City, wanted to play Madison Square Garden. That was my dream. Well, I got to do it. I got to do it uh, after a number of years of hard practice and many loud rehearsals. <laughs> and back in 1997, I was actually the guitar player of what was the top-selling band in the world three young kids from Tulsa, Oklahoma, a band called Hanson. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, you know, we sold a lot of records and just did so many cool things in the industry. Played every show you can imagine. Uh, David Letterman, Jay Leno, Rosie O'Donnell. We did Saturday Night Live, Today Show, Good Morning America. Um, the list goes on and on. And, and we got to end that year playing uh, at the White House for a Christmas party. So definitely a pretty good ride. A lot of amazing experiences and um you know, just just a lot of fun, and and playing Madison Square Garden was really the dream. And it was interesting, actually. I'll tell this story maybe a little bit earlier than I usually do in my hearing protection uh, presentations. But you know, we were when people think of loud rock and roll, they think of the Who as being the loudest band in the land. And um, while that may be true, we gave them a run for their money in Hanson. Actually, it was back in Toronto where we were clocked at 140 decibels. Now, 140 decibels, that's the equivalent of standing behind a jet engine. So it's a pretty serious amount of noise, and actually that's what it was. We couldn't even hear ourselves play, and in those days we didn't have in-ear monitors, so we were just wearing earplugs up on stage because what that sound was was 40,000 screaming 13-year-old girls. I mean, 
<laughs> it's an amazing sound if you've never heard it. In fact, I had to pull one of my earplugs out because I just wondered what does 40,000 screaming 13-year-olds actually sound like. And I pulled it out, and I have to say that that was a um, not a great decision because it's like Velcro and, and tinfoil going on inside your head. And I immediately put that earplug in, you know, probably half a second later, realizing that it wasn't a great idea. And I can tell you from that moment, I still today suffer a little bit of high-frequency damage in my right ear, simply from pulling out that earplug for less than a second. But at least I do know what 40,000 screaming 13-year-old girls sound like. And we we called it a squeakency because that's what it was like. It was a big squeak that would come over the audience. But, you know, it's um, it all started with that dream, it, that dream to be uh, Angus Young of ACDC and play loud rock and roll. The thing was I had another dream. I always wanted to be the captain of a 747. And, I, you know, to be honest, there were many times that I was in, the, in my recording studio looking at all the buttons and lights, imagining I was in the cockpit of a 747 with all the button lights. You can see there's, there's sort of a symmetry to it there. Well, I went after it in 2008. I got my pilot's license, and just like all of you, I got to live that dream and really experience what I think really is the greatest thing. As I always say in my motivational presentations, you know, we, we're lucky people. We have the opportunity to participate in one of humanity's greatest achievements, the magic of flight. And so I learned to fly and did everything we all did, learning to fly all my cross countries and all of that. And actually, you know, one of the great things in my first 100 hours, I got to fly all of these different aircraft. So, you know, not only got a lot of great experience, but also heard a lot of different noisy general aviation airplane environments. Um, because every airplane's a little different. And that's one of the things that we have to take into consideration when we choose the equipment that we're going to fly with, is how do we protect ourselves in all these different types of environments. So it really brings us back to that question. Why do I meet more hearing impaired pilots than musicians? So let's break this down a little bit because I, I really didn't expect that and I started to think about it more. Well, you know, music spans the frequency spectrum. Aircraft relentlessly push the same one. So think about that. When you're listening to a concert, when I'm playing a concert, I'm going up and down on a whole bunch of different frequencies. But aircrafts are just punishing our ears with the same frequencies, the sound of the engine, the sound of the wind, all the different frequencies that come into the cabin of an aircraft into the cockpit. And that's something that causes a lot of damage because it is the relentless push of those same frequencies. Now, one of the advantages, yeah, rock and roll is loud, but we're in concert and recording environments, and acoustics are taken into consideration. So in a sense, we are in protected environments as musicians. But airplanes are always trying to get that maximum useful load, so nobody's putting in extra dampening or anything to protect your ears. It really, it's up to you. And, and OSHA, the Occupational Safety Haz uh, Hazard Association, and the FAA actually don't regulate um, in the manufacturing in order to protect your ears. The FAA does have an articulation index. I just put that in there on the screen because it's kind of funny. They say as long as the two pilots up front can hear 41% of unpredictable syllables, 72% of rhyming words, and 92% of sentences, well, it's safe enough. I don't know. We've got great technology. There is no reason for us to be compromising our safety in any way because we have technology that can make sure that we're hearing 100% of what anyone else is saying to us, whether it's a fellow pilot or whether it is ATC. So we have to take advantage of that technology. And then third, the musicians' lives revolve around their ears. I mean, that's why we're so conscious of our ears uh, because it brings us so much happiness and it's our livelihood. Unfortunately, pilots only become aware of their ears once they start failing, and that's the worst time, and especially for a pilot, because all of our lives do depend on our hearing. It is an amazingly important sense that gives us um, a lot of, of awareness in the cockpit of not only the things that are obvious, but some of the things that are not obvious. So it is a safety issue to make sure that you preserve your hearing. And of course, um, if your safety is compromised, then it's not just you, it's your passengers and people on the ground as well. So I kind of think of it as a social responsibility as well. Let's look at some numbers. National Institute of Health, the NIH on noise-induced hearing loss, NIHL. So we're good as pilots with acronyms, so I know you all understand NIH and NIHL. Um, 15% of Americans ages 20 to 69, that's about 26 million people, have hearing loss, probably due to noise. So 
that's pretty significant. Here's this one really scares me. 16% of teens report some hearing loss, probably due to noise. And I think um, we could probably guess what that's about. Really loud iPods and lousy environments. You know, if you're in a, a, a not lousy environments, but loud environments. If you're in a loud environment and you have headphones in your ears and you just have a tendency to turn them up to a really loud volume in order to compensate. So I bet that's going on, what's going on with a lot of these teens. 16% of them report some hearing loss. Now, the NIH also tells us that sounds can be harmful, and especially when loud and long-lasting. So what comes to mind? You know, a nice flight in a 172 comes to mind. That's loud and long-lasting, especially if it's a nice cross-country. So these are the types of things that we really need to be aware of, especially on flights. Now, noise-induced hearing loss can be immediate or delayed temporary or permanent, and in one or both ears. That's kind of what's, I don't know, a little vicious about it, because if it's delayed, then um, we don't know for sure that, uh, that it's going to work out well um, for us. You know, we, we might find out that we have hearing loss after the fact, and I think that, um, that that's why you have to take preventative measures in order to prevent that from happening. You can't wait until it happens because once it happens, it's too late. There is nothing you can do about it. So it's important to take uh, all precautions possible. Now, even if you can't tell that you are causing damage, you could have trouble in the future. So that's, again, I don't know how many times I can emphasize it, but I think it's so important because, as I keep saying, I do meet more hearing impaired pilots than I do musicians. So even if you can't tell that you are causing damage, you could have trouble in the future. NIH tells us that one thing is certain, noise-induced hearing loss is something you can prevent. So I ask you the rhetorical question, if you can prevent it, why wouldn't you prevent it? You have to, it's just so important because we do have a problem, especially as, pilot, as a pilot community. It's kind of an interesting slide here. We all lose our hearing a little bit as we age. So hearing loss by the age of 50, if you were to ask the general public uh, a survey about the uh, amount of hearing loss uh, that they're suffering as a group. So like in this, for example, these two pictures here, I've got five business people on the left, and on the right, I've got five pilots. Now, by the age of 50, guess how many of those business people are reporting some degree of hearing loss? Well, about one, about one in five, but this is where it gets scary. How many of those pilots by the age of 50 are reporting some hearing loss? You probably guessed it, all five. So pilots are losing their hearing at five times the rate of the general public. Let me repeat that. Pilots are losing their hearing at five times the rate of the general public. So we most certainly do have a problem, and we can prevent it. So let's do it. Let's talk about some noise exposure. Um, you know, if we're just chatting on the phone or sitting in a room together talking, maybe in, uh, in the car driving somewhere, that's low risk. You know, we can do it for eight hours, probably even more than that. There's no risk in that whatsoever. But high risk, look what's there, GA airplane. At about 105 decibels, you're starting to put your ears at serious and permanent risk after only one hour unless you have appropriate protection on your ears. You have to protect your hearing appropriately because any flight after one hour is potentially causing you permanent hearing loss that you will never get back. Loud rock concert, I know something about that. We Probably most of us do. 15 minutes. 15 minutes without proper hearing protection, and your ears are at risk of permanent hearing loss. And then extreme risk. Uh, jet engine, 140 dB. That was like the Hanson concert I told you. As soon as I pulled out that earplug, I was not in great shape, and I'm suffering uh, from it now. So the loudest possible sound is 194. Let's hope that none of us ever experience that. But there's an easy way. All those numbers are hard to remember. There's a rule of thumb. If you have to shout over noise in order to be heard, your hearing is at risk. And you know, this just happened to me the other day. I was blowing leaves on my driveway. My wife comes out to me. She's yelling at something at me. And um, I couldn't hear her that well, but I was yelling back at her. And all of a sudden, I thought about this rule of thumb. And I said, what am I doing? I'm yelling over the leaf blower. I should be wearing hearing protection. Because if I have to yell, then the noise level of the leaf blower is 
probably going to cause me permanent hearing damage. So I just needed to be smarter about it, and I went and I got uh, some headphones and put them on to protect myself. And that's what we have to do. All of us have to be proactive pilots because it is noise-induced hearing loss is the only type of hearing loss that is completely preventable. We've got to be proactive. So we've got to know which noises cause damage, anything above 85 dB. We've got to wear ear protection on the ramp and at air shows. And use the highest quality headset that you can afford. Okay? Active and passive. It's actually the cheapest insurance money can buy. And I say that because, you know, good quality headsets last a long time. And if you take the average number of hours that, that a pilot flies and uh, a headset lasting for, you know, up to 10 years, it, uh, an expensive headset, like a $1,000 headset, actually amounts to $1 per flight hour. So think of everything you spend every hour when you go fly. Well, you can just add $1 to that and save your hearing. So I really do believe it is the cheapest insurance money can buy to protect that all-important sense of hearing. And I mentioned that, active and passive. Let's just talk about that. Active, electronic noise canceling, passive, basically acoustic construction. Hey, there's your ear. And there's the frequency range that we hear, roughly 25 hertz to 15,000 hertz or 15 kilohertz. I just drew a line in the middle there, 500 hertz. Uh, and the reason why that's an important line is because basically all of our communications are higher than 500 hertz, and our airplane engine is pretty much below 500 hertz. So that's a good median line to separate the two ranges where our ears are exposed to a lot of risk. Now, if you're going to lose your hearing, it's going to start in that upper range. So the first thing that goes are your communications and your quality of life, frankly, your ability to hear people in a restaurant and friends and uh, all the good things that we really enjoy. But in the airplane, your communications are basically the first thing that go. So a passive headset is something that is great. You know, and these are the, generally the less expensive ones because a passive gives you pretty good coverage over the entire range. And it certainly gives you very good coverage in that communications area. So by having a good passive headset, you won't lose the consonants because as soon as you start to lose your hearing and communication, the first thing that goes are your consonants. All you hear are vowel sounds, and that's what makes it so hard to understand linguistically. You also end up turning your intercom up to dangerous levels. It's the same thing I was talking about with the kids and the iPods. If the background noise is high, we end up turning the intercom high because it has to be 10 to 15 decibels above the background noise. You know what that does? It damages our ears, which leads to diminished quality of life. Now, the thing about, though, the um, engine noise is that as good as passive is, it could be better. And the great engineers who make these awesome headsets realize that active noise reduction, A&R, is something that does an excellent job at reducing the level of an airplane engine. And so this is really important because that it's that long rumbling of an engine that causes us fatigue. And if we're tired, let's face it, our comprehension is reduced, our attention span is limited, and we're not going to respond as quickly to things inside the cockpit that we need to respond to. So active A&R really does provide us a, a much safer environment. And that's why I always tell people that they should really get a good active headset that also has good passive protection. And that's the important thing, passive and active. And as you know, we talk about active being electric canceling, electronic canceling, but the construction of a headset is also really important for both passive and active. And I'm just showing you this diagram here because we know that sometimes head headphones um, are clamping on us too hard or if they're too loose, they're not providing a good enough seal. So that's one of the things I like, you know, really frankly about my S1 is that it gives me the opportunity to adjust the clamping force so that I can get just the right amount of pressure to give me a really good seal. That way, the noise on the passive side is not leaking through the seals, but it's also preserving the environment inside my headset to make the active better. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And, of course, comfort seals. We all know put on a pair of sunglasses, and all of a sudden that seal is broken on our headset. Well, not with this headset because it's got that really nice memory foam type of material right where the arms of your sunglasses go. So it just wraps around those, those arms and um, makes a really good seal, so preserving the passive and the active. That's the thing, passive and active. And then when you look at um, the new active digital headset, like the S1 Digital, that's pretty cool because you've got feed forward and feedback technology built into that. 
And what that does, and I'll explain a little bit more, but you see that imaginary line of 500 hertz that I've been talking about? Well, it raises it right up to 2,000 hertz, 2 kilohertz. So now the active is also protecting your communications. And as we mentioned, that's the first thing to go. So now you've got both passive and active noise reduction that is a much wider range of protection to really ensure that you don't lose your hearing. Just so you know how this, what this feed forward feedback stuff really means, here's a little bit of a graph, and I'll show you that arrow. That's just your ear, so the arrow's pointing at your ear, but then you've got the cup of the headset around there. Well, when you've got active, um, when you've got active noise reduction inside your headset, there's also a little microphone, and that microphone is listening to the sound, to the noise inside the headset. It's running it through a circuit, producing an inverse wave, and then blowing that inverse wave right out of a little speaker inside the cup. And what that does is it cancels the noise. The inverse wave cancels the original waveform. And that's really all active noise reduction is. It's amazing technology that, that works very well. When you have feed forward, then you've got a, another microphone right on the outside. And this is like what the S1 Digital does. It's got a microphone right on the outside of the headset. And what does that do? It captures that noise before it even leaks into your headset, runs it through that circuit, puts in the inverse wave, which it um, then amplifies out of that little speaker inside. You don't even hear it, by the way. It's just a wave that is canceling out the noise that you don't want to hear. So it's pretty cool technology. This feed forward and feedback does so much to really make the active noise reduction extremely effective inside your headset. To give you an idea, here's another graph. I don't like looking at graphs, but let me just try and break this down in a way at least that I can understand it, and maybe that'll help everybody else understand it. If I were to just draw a yellow line against that top, that's the sound of your airplane as soon as you get in and crank up the engine. That's the noise. Then you put on your headset. You should do it before that, by the way, but if you were to put on your headset afterwards, not t turning the headset on or anything, but just putting it on in a passive format, it's already brought that down to the level of a motorcycle. Now you click that active switch and you've brought the noise down to basically city traffic, which if you remember earlier, I mentioned that in traffic, you know, you're, you're good for eight hours pretty much inside your car. So that would be the same here with a good active headset. S1 Digital really makes it even more comfortable because once you press that smart button, it comes right down to the level of a conversation. And that really adds to your experience of flying and your enjoyment while also giving you pretty much the best protection that you can possibly get to save your hearing. So really the combo rules. You want to have active because it reduces your fatigue. You want to have passive because it protects your communication. And it keeps your hearing threshold lower. That's basically, you know, keeping the background noise down so that you can also keep your intercom a little bit lower. It makes everything more comfortable. It makes everything more safe. And I, talk, I think about frequency balance, balancing. As a musician, when I'm in the studio, that's what we do. You know, we pull back the guitars to make room for the vocals. We pull back the bass and make a little bit more room for the bass drum or something like that. That's what a good headset does. And when you have this digital technology, it's isolating the most offensive frequencies and pulling them back so that you can hear the frequencies that you want to hear without actually raising the volume. That's the key. So your whole environment is at a lower volume, which really makes everything so much safer and more enjoyable. So again, be a proactive pilot. Know which noises cause damage, anything above 85 dB. Rule of thumb, if you have to shout to be heard, it's dangerous. So do something about it. Invest in a premium headset, an investment of really what amounts to about a dollar per hour, especially if you're a CFI because you're logging a lot of hours. One thing is certain, noise-induced hearing loss is something you can prevent. I keep going back to that because this is something we can't prevent. We should be doing it. That's what they say. So that's really my presentation. Um, I hope that uh, you got something out of that. I think it's an extremely important, uh, just such an important thing that we all consider and invest in saving our hearing so that we not only are safer pilots, but we also preserve our quality of life and enjoy all the wonderful things that we like to listen to for the rest of our lives. So remember, once it goes, it doesn't come back. So you know, make that move and, and really make sure that you're protecting yourself. If you have any questions, please feel free to visit my website. Um, you can email me right from there. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have that we may not 
be able to address during this webinar. And of course, you can find me on all the social media. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to my friend Dave over at Sennheiser. And I know he's got um, some more great info to share with all of us. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And best of luck to all of you. Thanks, Robbie. Okay, as Dave gets set up here, we'll uh, take a quick moment here to switch over. And thank you again, Robbie. That was uh, extremely in informative. A lot of that stuff I certainly uh, wasn't aware of the details on, especially the five times as uh, uh, as likely to have hearing loss. That's pretty uh, scary, isn't it, Jeff? That, that, that is a that is a little frightening statistic. <laughs> um, another uh, quick note to everyone here who's on the call: feel free to use the chat feature if you have any questions. Post them there, and then we'll either handle them uh, during uh, the presentation as uh, is appropriate, or directly after. And so there's an area for you to just uh, type that uh, that in right there. So let's see, Dave, uh, I'll hand it over to you, and uh, you should have the uh, controls there. Ready to go now. Hi, have you got my screen, Jeff? Uh, no, you have to hit start, I think, on that. I guess I hit start a little premature. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, very good. All right. Well, thanks to Robbie for that, uh, that his, his personal experience on both the stage and in the cockpit and the importance of hearing. Uh, I thought I'd take a few minutes and acquaint you with a little bit of the background of Sennheiser as a company, our aviation history, and then some of the design principles we bring to bear to try to um, bring to the cockpit the kind of hearing protection that Robbie's talked about. Sennheiser started 70 years ago next year in a little farmhouse just north of Hanover. I'm not going to bore you with too much of that. But in 1945, Fritz Sennheiser started making test equipment. And by 1950, he was already well focused on acoustics and audio devices like microphones, like uh, mixing amplifiers and preamplifiers. And then in the 60s, the Sennheiser company really hit their stride with the introduction of the MD-421, which by the way is still available today, uh, and became the Beatles' microphone of choice during the 1960s. And then I'm sure more than a few of you out there have either owned or borrowed a friend's HD 414s. Those are those bright yellow foam open air ear, uh, headphones that were the, the first open headphones ever and remain the best selling headphone even to this day. Uh, so that's, that really put Sennheiser on the map that decade of the 60s. In 1980, Lufthansa came calling and asked Sennheiser to develop a headset for their uh, airline cockpit crew. They wanted something more convenient. Um, better sounding, more reliable than what they had. And Sennheiser developed what was called the LHM-14KA, uh, completed and certified for use starting in 1982. And it wasn't long after that that Sennheiser developed our first noise guard, active noise reduction headset for the professional cockpit, the LHM-45, in 1987. And that became the first active noise cancellation headset to obtain an FAA TSO certification, which is required for all cockpit devices. Sennheiser has grown quite a bit today. From that farmhouse, there's about 2,000 people employed. Uh, farmhouse is still on the campus of Sennheiser, which is shown in that photograph at the top of that slide, uh, and about another 2,000 people around the world working for Sennheiser. We've been in the general aviation business uh, for 23 years, obviously the commercial business longer than that, with the 1992 introduction of the uh, HMEC 200. And today, the S1 family, that's the S1 Digital that Robbie talked a little bit about, the S1 Noise Guard and the S1 Passive, are flying all over the world. In addition to our cockpit headsets flying in about 160 airlines worldwide, and our ATC headsets controlling all of the inbound and outbound traffic between North America and Europe today. So a little bit about headset design and design principles. If you consider that the headset is really part of your avionics, um, we have to understand that interface to a, a myriad of different audio panels. And in the commercial world, there are, there are standards, and some of those standards are applied in the, in the GA market. But we really have to be quite flexible with regard to the interface between the headset and the audio control panel or the intercom, because there are some differences. 
And we have to be aware of those differences and design for them so that uh, the headset functions properly. At the same time, the headset is the only avionics that you wear. So if it's not comfortable when you wear it, it's, uh, it's not going to do you any good because you're going to resist wearing it. And as Ravi pointed out, you need to wear it consistently. You need to wear it while you're around your airplane, while you're in flight to, to protect your hearing. But comfort isn't just about how it feels. It's also about how it presents that information and how it blocks the noise out uh, that you don't want to subject your ears to. So part of that, part of that trade-off with, with hearing protection and with information presentation is, as Ravi mentioned, the mechanical design of the headset and being able to adjust the clamping force and being able to have a, a large uh, ear cup, which helps with passive noise attenuation, as I'll explain in a minute, but also having comfortable ear seals that fit around your ear well and, and spread the pressure uh, that provide a good seal uh, to en enable the passive and the active noise reduction system to function. Providing information is also key to that comfort and also key to the uh, performance of the headset as an extension of your avionics. So we've got to have a speaker in there that's, that's high fidelity, but we've also got to be able to filter the noise that's filter the signal that's coming in uh, the way you want to hear it. So we apply a number of different filters depending on the input stream of the, uh, of the information so that when it's presented to you, it has the most natural sound. It has the complete spectrum of information that you're looking for. And we're able to do things such as this treble boost function to enable people who may have already lost a little of their high frequency hearing to regain some of those hard consonant sounds that Robbie mentioned you could lose over, over time with exposure to noise. We bump up that signal content a little bit so it's a little more uh, perceptible and makes for a more intelligible, intelligible communication stream. But obviously, if we don't suppress the noise, then that can lead to discomfort as well. So we apply NoiseGuard. NoiseGuard is our proprietary version of active noise reduction, and we think one of the better ones available in the market. But our goal is to suppress those noise over the broadest range of frequencies possible. So to do that, we apply both passive and the active. And the reason it's important to go after the noise across the full frequency spectrum is because of the way your ears react to noise. Even at low frequencies that um, may not be directly over the band of speech communication, when you're subject to noise at those low frequencies, your ears react to that. And there's an effect called the upward spread of masking, which raises all of your hearing thresholds at all frequencies. So even if you're subject to noise in the 100 of hertz range, your communication in the thousands of hertz range, you'll be tempted to turn your intercom up. And that's actually what is damaging your ears over time. If you're forced to drive your communication channel at higher and higher volume levels, you end up subjecting your ears to noise, which is eventually damaging. And you can experience that even when you're in your car. If, you, if you've driven your car with a window down and had the radio on, and you pull into the driveway and switch the car off, Next morning, you come back to the car and turn the car on, and man, the radio is just overwhelmingly loud. And that's because your ears and the hearing thresholds, your ears are relaxed when you get back in the car, whereas with the window open, your ears had adjusted to higher and higher hearing thresholds, driven, driving the, the volume of the radio up. So it's the same, same principle that happens in flight when you're trying to overcome um, the noise in the cockpit. So just a little bit of physics. Keep in mind how air travels in, uh, how sound travels in air, I'm sorry, and consider that at 100 hertz, the wavelength of that sound is 11.3 feet long, whereas at 5,000 hertz, that wavelength is only 2.7 inches long. And we've got to devise something that fits on your head that tries to combat noise across that really broad frequency range and really broad distribution of wavelengths of sound in air. So obviously, we can't devise something that's going to reject a wavelength that's 11.3 feet long, which is why electronic noise canceling is the best approach to go after those, those very low frequencies. But even at 5,000 hertz, you're still talking about a wavelength that's 2.7 inches. And you need an ear cup that has substantial uh, volume in order to um, prevent that kind of wavelength from getting in and allow some absorptive material to be put between your ears and that noise. So 
while volume of materials suppress those higher frequencies. That's what we call passive attenuation. That's what Ravi was referring to. You really have to go after those lower frequencies with the active noise reduction. At Sennheiser, we have design authority over all aspects of that active noise reduction gain control circuit. And we, we choose to do that by not buying in elements like transducers and by using ear cups that are designed specifically for the, the gain control circuit and the uh, transducer we put in there to provide the most stable ANR possible because ANR is a gain control loop and those red elements shown on that, on that uh, little schematic there are the ones that are essentially the most variable elements in that, in that equation. And those elements Sennheiser controls by manufacturing them and manufacturing them specifically for the ANR application. So that's why we're able to provide a very stable headset ANR solution over a very broad range of frequencies and volumes. So why go digital? ANR has been analog for a long time. It's done perfectly well. And when you implement something digitally, typically you end up driving a power consumption and it gets a little bit, it'll get warmer in that circuit. Well, the reason for that is so that we can adapt because the best ANR circuit designers uh, are still working on assumptions. They're working on assumptions about how the headset fits on your head and how the noise in your aircraft is, is affecting you and your ears. So with the fit on your head, you're, there are leaks that might occur that uh, may not have been um, taken into account by the designers, and that's based on the, the shape of your jaw, how you wear your glasses, whether or not you're wearing a ball cap, things like that. The noise in your aircraft might be specific. There might be certain frequencies that fans run at or air leaks run at or various other instruments in your aircraft may run at that might cause issues to an ANR circuit that's, that's designed and fixed in an analog format. With a digital circuit, we can, because this, the circuit's essentially running in software, we can make a measurement in situ on, on your head uh, when you command it with a smart update button and then update the software that's driving the ANR circuit to provide the, the optimum ANR, which is the least residual noise. And that happens uh, on the uh, Sennheiser S1 whenever you choose to push that button. And we do it that way because the, the noise in an aircraft is generally stable. It doesn't change dramatically uh, in a short period of time. And if we had the circuit continually searching for the optimum, it might actually introduce some, some unwanted effects and some spurious noise that, uh, that wouldn't help the situation. So that's why we believe that ANR is, a, is an important part of the solution, not only to reduce your exposure to low frequency noise and keep your hearing thresholds low, but it also keeps you relaxed, less fatigued, as Robbie points out. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff and see if anybody has any questions. Thanks, Dave. I definitely appreciate you, everything that uh, you've said on that. There's something that's always been interesting uh, to me, and that is one of the, the major differences, of course, that I've uh, noticed, uh, ha having spent time with lots of different uh, headsets, is that uh, more and more it seems like uh, different companies are, are moving ahead with A&R headsets that uh, uh, you know, have uh, open ports on them and move uh, less and less, it seems, away from uh, the passive side. And uh, I certainly uh, have noticed when batteries fail or things like that happen that you're, you really are left exposed in some cases. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And uh, because I have noticed that's a big difference when I've uh, when I've tried yours headsets. Yeah, we started with this, uh, this S1 design concept with the idea that we would create a family of headsets based on a good, solid, passive uh, foundation. And that passive foundation, which has come to market as the S1 passive headset, uh, provides all the same passive uh, hearing protection as a, as a good David Clark, about 23 dB um, NRR, which is, a, which is a laboratory measurement of how well a headset rejects noise over a broad frequency regime. And the reason we did that was just for the, motivated by what Ravi was talking about in terms of overall hearing protection. If, if you had exclusively an active headset, as we do, we make, we make exclusively active headsets called open active uh, for commercial aircraft because there is very little of the high frequency noise in, in a modern uh, commercial cockpit. Mostly you're looking at 
uh, engine driven noise through the fuselage and wind noise over the over the cockpit which tends to be lower frequencies so there are there are environments where that is appropriate a general aviation cockpit or for instance this you know this open cockpit that Gary Rowers flying in certainly not the case you are there exposed to uh, a, a, a of broad range of noise uh, at both low and high frequencies and the coupling of the passive with the active attenuation is really the only way to get uh, full protection over those over that broad range of frequencies and provide all the protection your ears need and that lessened stress level of being inundated with noise or having to drive your intercom volume up over the noise in the speech band um, for hours at a time, so it it really was a, a matter of trying to trying to design the optimum headset for the uh, the general aviation cockpit and the uh, noise exposure therein. Excellent. Well, I, I definitely appreciate that. And uh, just kind of as a, a last note, I know uh, certainly since I, I don't have any direct association with Sennheiser, it's easy for me to say a few things about you, but um, I, I really have been uh, impressed with the, uh, the headsets, uh, especially when it comes to things like fit and customization. I mean, the, the, the fact that you can change the size of them, the, the fact that they've got kind of the equalizer type uh, some type of you know settings that made it easier for me at least to have clarity. So I, I just want to say I appreciate that. We certainly appreciate everything that you do for Social Flight. Um, and we really appreciate everything, Ravi, as well for you for coming on and giving this wonderful presentation for everybody tonight. E extremely in informative. And uh, we're going to keep this up. Uh, we're here at Social Flight in order not just to promote general aviation, but to keep all of you involved in aviation throughout even the winter months. We do that through education and through this series of webinars by the leaders that we have within the aviation industry. And so uh, with that, I'd uh, just like to let everybody know that a recording will be available of this presentation. We'll make that available through Social Flight. You'll get a, a, a link to that following this meeting. Feel free also to uh, uh, contact uh, uh, any of the folks that have been here through their prospective websites and directly at Sennheiser Aviation and those links also will be in the email that you get following this. And of course, spread the word about social flight to your friends and anyone that you know in aviation, completely free, mobile apps as well as on the web. And so again, thank you all for attending, and we look forward to seeing you at our next part in the series. Take care.